White Legs must have been watching for a long while, counting who remained. We didn't think the White Legs were a real threat. Maybe it was overconfidence. Maybe sloth. Either way, we didn't see them coming. They attacked at night. They killed without regard to age or infirmity, armed or unarmed. They beat children to beat them to death in their beds while they were sleeping. And now we're all that's left. Maybe 30 of us. Pride goeth before destruction. But we can't expect God to do all the work. The story of New Canaan invokes the images of one of the most well-known figures in Fallout despite his face being wrapped to hide the scars that lie beneath. It goes far beyond him, however, as he was just a piece of their puzzle. We have to go back to the origins of many stories in Fallout, back to a vault. Now do note going forward that there will be content described that is from Van Buren, the cancelled Fallout 3 that was to be made by Black Isle Studios, not Bethesda Game Studios. We find ourselves starting off with Vault 70 in specific, a vault in Utah that was home to many Mormons who purchased their way in prior to the Great War. The vault was of course, as many others, a part of the Vault Experiment Program. Vault 70 would have faulty vault suit extruders in it that would fail to produce new vault suits after six months. I'm not sure of the purpose of this other than to potentially create issues with identity. The purpose of a vault suit is to provide similarity, as one cannot show status via their apparel if everyone is wearing the same thing, even the overseer. In tight quarters where tensions could spark and people could align themselves politically or otherwise with their apparel, the vault suits can aid in staving off this issue. Given the inhabitants of Vault 70 were mostly, if not entirely, Mormon, perhaps this never played a factor. They found uniformity in their religion and never fell victim to one of vault Tech's experiments. Another interesting aspect of Vault 70 is that it was given three Gex, or Garden of Eden creation kits. These are the terraforming devices to begin again and create a new world on top of the one destroyed by the bombs. Most vaults were only given two Gex, some only received one. By the year 2190, the Mormon vault dwellers would arise from their vaults and find Salt Lake City, the largest pre-war city in Utah. For some perspective, the original Fallout was set in 2161 meaning Vault 70 opened 29 years after the origins of the series. The Vault Dwellers would use their three Gex to recreate the city of Salt Lake, but it would not be New Canaan. It would be called New Jerusalem. Naturally, they would be a society structured off of their religion, led by a prophet and apostles. This leadership would vote to not do business with outsiders, whether it was refugees or tribals. They were cautious as any wise Vault Dwellers would be entering a new world. For example, the Vault Dwellers of Vault 3 would not be so wise, as they would open their doors and allow some locals to sample their hospitality. Those locals would turn out to be the fiends, and the dwellers of Vault 3 would be no more. Unfortunately, sometimes there are no right answers, as those groups of turned away tribals and refugees would gather together and destroy New Jerusalem, along with all of those who were too proud to flee. The survivors of New Jerusalem would be led by their prophet named Judah Black, and he would take them north to the remains of the city of Ogden, Utah. Here is where the Mormon survivors would finally establish the town of New Canaan. Now this is where things can get a little confusing as there are two versions of New Canaan in theory. One from Fallout New Vegas and one from the cancelled Van Buren. Luckily they aren't very different, we just don't get to visit New Canaan in Fallout New Vegas. One of the changes we actually do see has to do with a different story for the demise of New Jerusalem from Van Buren that attributes its destruction to famished refugees of the NCR and Brotherhood of Steel Wars fleeing from California. There was a rumor of the Mormons having tons and tons of food and the desperate refugees would sack the town. Perhaps both stories are true and it's simply a matter of how the story gets told. The town of New Canaan would grow and seemingly grow far beyond the success of New Jerusalem as the Mormons would control long stretches of trade routes throughout the lands north of the Mojave Desert. 
they would also lean more heavily into becoming an armed and defended culture given the demise of New Jerusalem and the state of the region around them. They were surrounded by raiders, warlords, and groups of cannibals to make matters even worse. This would lead to them infusing the 45 auto pistol within their culture, which is a reference and regard to John Moses Browning, a real-world firearm designer and Mormon who was born in Ogden, Utah. New Canaan would become so successful from its humble beginnings that it would eventually offer genuine competition to NCR companies like the Crimson Caravan. They would maintain similar principles to their values in New Jerusalem by limiting the presence of competition within their walls, but eventually they would allow the Crimson Caravan to set up a post in New Canaan while also taxing them. This speaks to the quality and usefulness of New Canaan as a trade hub, given the Crimson Caravan was willing to pay this tax just to get within their walls. Once again, things must take a turn for the worse for the ever-struggling Mormons of the Wastes. The lives of the New Canaanites would become intertwined with a man named Edward Sallow, who I covered in a different video. To keep things short, the New Canaanites would send out a man named Joshua Graham to spread the good word and aid a group of followers of the apocalypse with the tribal groups in the southwest near the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Among the group of followers was a man named Edward Sallow, and he with Joshua at his side would go on to establish Caesar's Legion. Oddly enough, this faction would go on to become one of the greatest threats to the societies both of these men had walked out of. Though the Legion would remain strong, Joshua as Caesar's legate in the Battle of Hoover Dam would fail, and despite his loyalty and usefulness to Caesar, he would still be made example of for how little failure is tolerated by the tyrannical despot, and Graham would be set on fire and tossed into the Grand Canyon, a tale for another time. However, he would wander back to New Canaan, his long-lost home, and survive the cataclysmic event somehow. Despite having become such a monster, the forgiving nature of the religious settlement would absolve Joshua Graham of his past failures and welcome him with open arms. He would even be recognized as a prodigal son of sorts. Little did they know the baggage he brought with him. Caesar, known for having a vast network of spies via his frumentari, would discover the man he thought he had killed. He would eventually send another character many of us know all too well, Ulysses, who was one of Caesar's greatest frumentari at the time. Ulysses would take a page out of Caesar's book and enlist the assistance of a tribe. That tribe would be the White Lakes, a group that inhabited the Great Salt Lake region, perhaps making a home in the carcass of New Jerusalem. The New Canaanites knew of the White Lakes and dealt with them regularly. Ulysses would teach them the ways of the Legion, however provide them tactics, help them raid through armories to gather superior arms like the 45 auto submachine guns that they called storm drums, and prepare a proper assault on the settlement of New Canaan. Because the White Legs did not know how to help themselves, Ulysses taught them how to destroy, how to take, and how to act as predators, with New Canaan being their prey. In turn, they would adopt his hairstyle as a mark of their tribe and culture, something he likely takes more shame than pride in. Their attack would begin at night, a night they knew Joshua Graham and other capable fighters were away from the settlement. With the throat of the new Canaanites exposed, the white legs would take the opportunity to sink their teeth in deep. They killed women, children, and elderly without hesitation. The scene was a bloodbath, with the elder bishop named Mordecai being burned alive in his home as a cherry on top of their devastation. The bishop wasn't even able to walk. So when the White Legs set his two-story home on fire, he was unable to even attempt an escape. To make matters worse, the leader of the White Legs, Salt Upon Wounds, would make his name with his trademark tactic by salting the land of New Canaan, destroying the soil and plants in the area. He is the only member of the White Legs who did not adopt the haircut of Ulysses, perhaps to maintain his control over the tribe. This was a tactic used by the original Roman Legion, which perhaps inspired Salt Upon Wounds to use it and win favor with Caesar so that his tribe might be accepted into the ranks of the Legion. With New Canaan now destroyed, a small group once again like the one that fled New Jerusalem would now flee to Zion with the White Legs on their tail, thus putting an end to New Canaan as it was. However, something that is reinforced through the hearts and minds of those who remain from the Mormon settlement is that New Canaan is not just a place, it is a people. It's an idea. They will start again, persistent as always. Joshua, along with another leader who emerged from the destruction of New Canaan named Daniel, sit as two opposing heads of the Mormons. 
Joshua wants to seek vengeance on the White Legs and show them what it is like to be on the other side of the Legion's tactics. Daniel wants nothing to do with the path Joshua is taking. Regardless of the direction they follow, the path of the new Canaanites is now very uncertain. Something must change as now twice they have settled and been destroyed with so many of their members being killed. Now 91 long, arduous years have passed since those original settlers cracked open Vault 70 and began anew. How many times must they start over just to simply get trampled on again? Perhaps they can push further northeast to avoid the expanse of the Legion and NCR, but this might just delay an inevitable repeat of the destruction they have already experienced. Perhaps they should consider moving within NCR borders, but they may lose themselves in the process. It's unsure we will ever see a continuation or conclusion of the New Canaanites story. Regardless, thank you for watching, and until next time. We wear more clothing than them and understand more about technology, but we're still a tribe, a linked family of families. The Boneyard, Phoenix, New Vegas, they're just places, metal and stone. New Canaan dies, but the tribe lives on. When the walls come tumbling down, when you lose everything you have, you always have family. And your family always has tribe.